everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Becca and this is Shota. Back How's it going? My, yep, he is in my house right now, which is so funny. Um, what are you doing here? Uh, I'm just in town visiting uh, on some business and uh, figured since I'm already here, I might as well stop by and see Becca and meet the puppies. Yes. Yeah, and they've been all over him and really enjoying a new friend. <laughs> But today we have just some general soil questions to answer. I put a question box on my Instagram, you know, just to see what you guys were wondering about in regards to soil. So it's just gonna be a very chilled out soil Q&A. So we have an entire playlist of videos that we've done before that were more specific. So if you wanna check those out, we've done garden soil, we've done fertilizer. Yeah, how compost is made. How compost is made. We did soil components for making your own soil if you wanna mm -hmm. do that. As I said, we're just gonna be answering questions. Or Shota really is gonna be answering questions. <laughs> okay, so we know that there's different types of compost. So what are they and what are the benefits of each application? Sure, so you have several different kinds of compost. One would be like landscape trimmings, one would be uh, manure based, uh, another could be food waste or even uh, human manure or basically biosolids is what we call them. And generally speaking, you can use them interchangeably. You know, when it comes to choosing a compost, the one thing I would look for is something that is made locally, something that's produced near you, and ideally that's got the US Composting Council seal testing assurance. Realistically, most compost as an organic material is going to provide a similar amount of nutrients and a similar amount of organic material and realistically, it just comes down to the quality of the finished product mm -hmm. opposed to what exactly is this compost made out of. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I couldn't think of a specific reason to use one over the other. Mm -hmm. The only one that I might be thinking is like their steer manure. And it'll, it'll come in a bag that says steer manure and it's lightly composted material and that stuff works really well but it's a little bit hotter mm -hmm. than your standard compost and looking for something that has a good carbon and nitrogen ratio that's well composted is going to be most suitable for incorporating in your garden you know the more done or the better the cnn ratio is the better it's going to perform in your garden immediately where if you put something like raw manure in your garden before that's active and before it provides any benefit to the garden, it has to break down. Mm -hmm. And so that's the one thing I would look out for. Other than that, you can kind of use whatever is most available, whatever is local and mm -hmm. whatever your preference is. I saw a listing on Marketplace a couple weeks ago that said like aged manure. Mm -hmm. So aged manure would be fine to just to put directly, like you can just get aged manure. You in. could, but you're still kind of risking with aged manure that if it hasn't been composted properly, mm -hmm. then it could have salmonella or fecal chloroform mm. or other things because aged manure can get hot and can break down. But if they're not actively composting it and turning the material mm -hmm. and checking on the material or taking temperatures, you could have some negative aspects of it. Or you could get these pockets that were dry mm. and you really, it's just dry aged manure. And mm. that's as soon as it's wet and put in a garden, it might cause havoc or nitrogen robbing mm -hmm. or just kind of rotting at the bottom of your raised bed garden. Okay. Okay. So but, what's this seal of approval? Cause you mentioned that yesterday too. Like yeah. what is that? So the U S composting council puts out these guidelines and sets these testing requirements. So compost manufacturers can have their products tested at a certified lab that ensures that the products are meeting these guidelines mm -hmm. set by the U.S. Composting Council. It's an effort to create like a national standard for compost, mm -hmm. basically. So that way you can look at that product and know that it's been composted properly mm -hmm. if it has that seal testing assurance. Okay. And our home compost is obviously not going to have that. So like, no. how would we know that our home compost is going to be effective? There's a couple ways about how you can look at that. And it's kind of based on what you think would be effective, right? So if you have your home compost, the real issue with home composting is that you're not going to meet those requirements that commercial composters in the USCC seal testing assurance program. And that's like meeting those temperature requirements of 131 degrees Fahrenheit and above for 15 days. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And so you're not going to be absolutely certain that it's free of pathogens mm -hmm. or weed seeds, but you can still use it in your garden. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't discount home compost because it just because it doesn't have the seal or just because it's not going to reach those temperatures doesn't mean it's not going to be effective in the soil. Mm -hmm. One thing I would do is screen your home compost to mm -hmm. screen out the fines because those are the real benefit. The other thing is you could also, like here in Missouri, you could put your home compost into your garden at the end of the fall growing season. Mm -hmm. And then over the winter, it's going to continue to break down. So by spring, you know, you'll have a nice healthy soil mm -hmm. that's ready to rock. Okay. So it's just about timing, you know, the older and the longer that it's aged, the more broke down it will be and the better it will perform. Okay. And then the other thing too is to avoid putting um, things like meat or cheese mm -hmm. or things like that into your garden or using your home composting for stuff you're not going to eat. Yeah. You know, there's nothing wrong with growing vegetables with your home composting, but if you're concerned about those fecal chloroform and salmonella and other pathogens, mm -hmm. then maybe using your home composting for your fruit trees or your flower beds where yeah. the soil won't be touching the fruit. Because yeah. growing is not going to pull unhealthy stuff into the, the fruit or onto the vine, but it's more risk of something unhealthy touching the outside of your vegetables. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. So it wouldn't be like infused, it's just on the outside. Exactly. So if you wash your vegetables really well, then yeah. you don't have to be concerned, which is another thing that, you know, like I don't always wash my vegetables when mm -hmm. I eat them out of the garden. Sometimes I just eat them, yeah. you know. Yeah, same. So, yeah, that's kind of, you just strate you can strategically use your home compost okay. in places and then use uh, a certified tested material for other things. Mm -hmm. But overall, you know, it's your life. You're the one risking it. And yeah. honestly, you know, you'll probably be fine either way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you can get bulk compost from like lots of different places. Mm -hmm. You guys do it. Yeah. Um, there's a few places in Columbia that do it. You just have to probably just Google search bulk compost and then your city mm -hmm. and then they can deliver it too. And I, I would suggest delivering it because last time I picked it up myself mm -hmm. and I overloaded my truck and oh, almost yeah. threw in the suspension. Yeah. yeah. I've done that heavy. to my own truck yeah. before. <laughs> it's heavy. I didn't even yeah. realize. I got two scoops mm -hmm. and way too much. So yeah. I guess that'd be two cubic yards or something. Mm -hmm. Or yard? I don't know. Yeah, a yard is yards. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it was way too much and mm -hmm. Um, I'm still living with the that mistake. <laughs> Let's talk about soil amendments for the vegetable garden. What okay. would you suggest? So the basic rule of thumb with raised bed gardens is that you want to replenish the soil and the nutrients that the vegetables take up every growing season. And so most of your prep is going to be, or the most of your amendment application is going to be prior to the growing season. And what I like to recommend is to replace the compost or use compost as a replacement because as the material decomposes, as you're growing, as it compacts, you'll probably notice that in your garden bed, the soil will slowly start to settle. Mm -hmm. And the idea is each season you want to replace that material with compost. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is you can sprinkle it on top or till it in, but replacing the lost material as organic material breaks down with compost. And then the other one we recommend is using an organic fertilizer like the Supermix organic fertilizer to top off the nutrients in that garden bed. And then throughout the growing season, you can use different kinds of amendments, um, including the Supermix or whatever is your preference to continuously add nutrients to the soil as mm. plants are growing. Because as they're growing, they're pulling nutrients out of the soil. Mm. And like for me personally, what I do is compost, super mix, plant, then about three weeks in, I'll add a half dose of super mix, and then I'll do a half dose of the super mix organic fertilizer about every two weeks, and then usually that's about all I do. I like to keep mm -hmm. it nice and simple and yeah. easy and not too much. Fertilizing every two weeks? That's crazy. I didn't do that. I didn't no. fertilize not even once, once last year. Really? And you had good... Which is so bad. Yeah. It, I mean, things were okay, yeah. but not a lot. Like, 
I had a lot of foliage, but not a ton of fruits. Mm -hmm. That's probably why, right? That could be. That could also be from pollinators or from ambient temperatures yeah. as flowers and fruiting can be temperature sensitive. Yeah. But yeah, it could also be nitrogen or phosphorus or any one of the yeah. fertilizer yeah. or sorry, any one of the nutrients um, that you might've been missing. Mm -hmm. But I do that basically just cause it's an easy way to always know that there's plenty of nutrients in the soil. Yeah. Like I'm not going out there and dumping a whole bunch on there. For the super mix in particular, the recommended dose is a half cup per square foot. Mm -hmm. So usually I'll do about a quarter cup per square foot yeah. every two weeks. My thinking or my philosophy behind that is that I fertilize more often with less fertilizer. That way I'm always continuously improving the soil health, but I know I'm not putting too much in. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's just kind of my easy way to do it where I know I'm not missing anything, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I'm not overdoing it. Yeah. Because there is a tendency where, you know, if you forget to do it and then you're just like, I'm going to put a ton on and then, mm -hmm. you know, the plants don't use it right away. So you could just be losing it to the atmosphere or the water or mm -hmm. leaching it into the soil and the groundwater, which mm -hmm. is a big problem with mm -hmm. fertilizer and home gardeners are the number one overusers of fertilizers so mm. less is more and doing it more often with less is how i yeah been treating it just because i feel like that's a healthy and easy way to do it mm -hmm. okay so if someone has heavy clay or heavy mm -hmm. rocky soil what would you suggest so the easiest thing is a raised bed garden because yeah. then you're not digging in the clay and you're not digging in the soil um, clay is pretty easy to deal with Mm -hmm. Because as you amend clay with organic material and you could also add exported native dirt or sand or things like that to it, which I think would be relatively unnecessary. But if you just add compost and till it in and mix it in, you know, eventually you'll be able to grow stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't think yeah. it's the end of the world. Rocks, on the other hand, take a little bit more work and you have to kind of pull the rocks out or dig it up and screen it. Yeah, I have really heavy clay soil here and what I've done, just in the individual places that I've planted stuff, mm -hmm. I dig out the hole and then I add just the garden soil into the hole mm -hmm. and then it has like a little pocket to mm -hmm. get that nutrients from. But on a bigger level, I just did raised beds because I know that my soil is heavy clay and it would take a lot of work to, I mean, it's not a lot of work, but like, to do in ground and in, in heavy clay soil, you have to like completely till it and mm -hmm. mix in the compost. Yeah. Unless you did no dig, I don't know how you could do no dig if you need to amend the soil. Like how does like, no dig blows my mind? But that's just where yeah. people lay down cardboard and then put mounds on ten top inches of, it, right? of compost or soil on top of it. Yeah. And I suppose it would work, but. It's like a raised bed without borders. Basically, yeah. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm trying to think for my cut flower garden, I I wanted to have it tilled because, I don't know, I, I want to plant in ground for that. Mm -hmm. But I know it's really heavy clay, so it just probably wouldn't be very good for the plants like initially, but it rains so much that like the person can't even come out. So Shota suggested that I just rent like a little rototiller mm -hmm. on my own and just like head out there on like a sunny day or something after it's had some time. But like this guy has like a big rig, so yeah. it'd be like more intense. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm I'm planting in clay soil and it's not that bad as long as you put garden soil in the in there. And also if you plant more shallow too, Jeff from Vintage Hill told mm -hmm. me that if you plant more shallow in, like you you sort of. Um, mound up the soil like you dig the hole shallower than you think mm -hmm. put some soil at the bottom and then you sort of mound up soil around it because okay. the root ball will be above ground but mm -hmm. you just kind of like a raised bed yeah um, that's better for clay soil so that okay. it doesn't have to be in it because it kind of makes like a plastic bag effect mm -hmm. you know like the moisture just right. stays there in that pocket that you dug so that's what he told me to do mm -hmm. and it worked out yeah. So anyone at home has that issue, but rocky soils, yeah. I don't know how how someone could do rocky soil. That's kind of hard. Yeah, I just wouldn't let the rocks get you down. You know, 
-hmm. because ultimately if, if there's enough organic material in the soil and the problem is that you just have some rocks mm -hmm. the plants are going to plant in it and so as long as you can plant the the roots are going to form mm -hmm. and over time you can pull all the rocks yeah. out or you can spend a lot of time screening and cleaning up the soil in that area but mm -hmm. i wouldn't stress about too much and just start planting and over time it will improve mm -hmm. This is something, I just did a repotting video a couple weeks ago and people asked me what I do with my old soil mm -hmm. and I either just throw it away or I, or I compost it, like I put mm -hmm. it out in my pile yeah. by the garden. So what would you suggest doing? Like what's the best, I guess like eco way as well to reuse soil or what to do with it? Yeah, um, if you're repotting and you have a bunch of extra soil, putting it in your compost is a great way because that's just going to add, you know, more broken down material to your um, your compost or what I do at the office is I just spread it out in the yard and I just have an area that's mm -hmm. slowly being covered with old potting soil mm -hmm. and eventually it'll be super fertile yeah or you could throw it in like around here you could just throw it around the base of a tree yeah. or even into your raised bed gardens yeah. depending on the type of Okay. Most soils, you should just be able to yeah. throw into the tree or your compost or into yeah. an, a raised bed garden, assuming that there's nothing that you're worried about that's in the soil. Yeah. Let's say it's De La Tanks. So that has the cocoa chips mm -hmm. and the pumice. Is mm -hmm. that going to pose any issues later down the line? No. If it was the De La Tanks, I would put it out probably in my garden because mm -hmm. incorporating the cocoa chip and the pumice is going to provide the garden with more aeration and water holding capacity and both those ingredients will last a long time so for that i would just toss into my raised bed it's not going to hurt anything and hopefully provide more drainage and aeration and water holding okay how can you tell if soil has nutrients in it still you can't look at soil in your hand and be like that has yeah nutrients in it i mean there's an essence of like you could tell that it's a rich soil yeah but realistically if a plant's in it the plant will tell you whether or not it needs nutrients yeah and that doesn't necessarily mean the soil doesn't have nutrients it just means it doesn't have enough for the plants needs mm -hmm. but short of lab testing it there's really no good way of knowing whether or not your soil has nutrients in it and yeah. how much yeah because how much is really the question because realistically depending on different kind of plants needs you could have too much nutrients mm -hmm. in the soil so yeah yeah and in terms of house plants it would be i mean what my guess is is obviously this is if i buy a brand new bag of soil i know that there's nutrients in it mm -hmm. and usually you don't have to start putting fertilizer on your house plants for like three, maybe four months. Mm -hmm. And especially with the Dela tanks, it comes pre-fertilized. So in addition yeah. to like the nutrients it's getting from the compost, we also have the super mix mm -hmm. fertilizer in it already. So it, it gets a boost. So you might even be able to wait a little longer, like maybe six months. Yeah, it really depends. Like I have house plants that were planted in the Dela tanks mix mm -hmm. when we first came out with it. Mm -hmm and I haven't ha added any more super mix. Mm -hmm. And that's probably not what you should do at home, <laughs> but the plants are not dying. No, yeah, they'll yeah, be fine. And honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, I should probably fertilize all the house plants when I get home. Yeah, you'll see a lot of new growth. Okay, this, this new leaf came out mm -hmm. like a week after this came out. Mm -hmm. This is coming out wow. literally like a week after this came out. Yeah. So w as soon as I started fertilizing, they mm -hmm. just blew up. Yeah growth okay but like yeah that's the thing with houseplants is i didn't fertilize for years because mm -hmm. i didn't think about it i didn't really think it was that important and then we started chatting so much about soil mm -hmm. and i was introduced to the super mix which is so easy mm -hmm. and i was just like oh my gosh i need to do this yeah and I, I started and my plants are growing like crazy which is really cool i mean mm -hmm. it's I stopped like thinking that i was doing something wrong yeah because they just weren't doing anything now they actually are and it's really cool so, yeah, but they'll just stay stagnant if you don't. Like, they're not going to die. They'll yeah. just be chilling mm -hmm. pretty much. Yeah, exactly. Like, fertilizer and richness in the soil is going to show in the plant mm -hmm. with new growth. Yeah. 
again. Okay, so that's how you know if a soil has nutrients or not. And of course, if you're buying it in a pre-made bag, I mean, you can pretty much, I mean, they, there should be nutrients in it. So yeah. hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> you have been gardening for mm -hmm. a number of years. How do you keep weeds and harmful bugs out of your, you do raised beds. Right? Yeah, mostly raised yeah. beds. So how do you keep weeds and pests out of them without hurting pollinators or the plant itself? You know, I've been fortunate enough that I haven't had a lot of pests in my garden. I've never had a mm -hmm. pest issue severe enough that I've had to do a treatment. Mm -hmm. I'm sure eventually someday I will have a pest issue yeah. that I need to have treated. Um, and if that is the problem, what I would recommend is calling um, Arbico Organics, which is a Tucson company that specializes in organic pest management solutions, mm -hmm. or going to your local nursery and asking them what they would recommend for your problem. Mm -hmm. I've had some caterpillars basically, and that's mm -hmm. really the worst of it. And yeah. those I just kind of picked off when I found them mm -hmm. and put them in like a different part of my yard or, yeah. or fed them to the chickens. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. But aside from that, I haven't had any of those yeah. major pest issues. Um, in the commercial setting, in my experience, it's all about preemptive pest control. So using uh, predatory bugs. We did a lot of that in the pecan orchards mm -hmm. or in like field crop. It's mostly mm -hmm. spraying, which I wouldn't recommend for home growers. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have got good healthy soil and good plants, they'll be able to protect themselves mm -hmm. from pests. And so that'd be the first thing I would do is just worry about and spend your time and energy building healthy soils to grow healthy plants. Mm -hmm. That way their natural processes for protecting themselves can be brought to, you know, the top notch game. Mm -hmm. And then as far as weeds and things like that, you can mulch, you can tarp and solarize the soil before planting and then just weeding by hand, which I know nobody wants to hear is yeah, realistically the easiest thing to do is when you start seeing little bits of weeds growing in your garden, you just pull them out right away. Because mm -hmm. the longer you wait, the more invasive they become. Mm -hmm. And either treating or solarizing or replacing the soil before planting and then trying to keep up with it yeah. as it comes in is probably the best way yeah. to manage that. Yeah. I wasn't expecting there to be so many weeds in my raised beds. Yeah. Like there's a lot. And actually, <laughs> <laughs> this is so silly, but I, I planted carrots in the mm -hmm. fall and they were weed seeds. They weren't carrots. Really? Yeah. Full, fully weed seeds. And on my Instagram, I was posting and I was like, oh my gosh, look at my carrots growing. Because mm -hmm. they were in a row. They yeah. were, I was like, I've never seen carrots look like this, but they're, they're where? growing exactly where <laughs> I planted. Yeah. So yeah, in, in literal rows and I'm pulling them up and I'm seeing the taproot and I'm like, oh, I pulled it too soon because yeah. <laughs> I think it's a carrot. <laughs> and they just ended up being weeds. Yeah, they're just oh, weeds. Oh, wow. Yeah, there was one carrot that came up and I'm yeah. just going to leave it and see what happens. But um, yeah, I was like shocked. But now there's so many weeds in my garden mm -hmm. beds and for, for some reason in my mind, I'm like, oh, it's, um, it's like a, a volunteer or this mm -hmm. or that. So... I mean, before you pull the weeds, make sure it's not a volunteer because I'm probably gonna have a lot of volunteer tomatoes. Mm -hmm. But I, you know what, a, you know what a tomato leaf looks like. It's yeah. not, it does not look like a weed. So mm -hmm. just double check you're not pulling out volunteers. But yeah, I was pretty shocked, and it makes sense though because birds and stuff like probably. Yeah, or even or just wind blown. Wind, yeah. Yeah. Landscape cloth or cardboard, like which do you think? Is better you can go either way honestly yeah. and the nice thing about cardboard is that over time and long term you know it's gonna break down and provide organic material to the soil so it's a little bit more of a natural solution mm -hmm. that being said landscape cloth is designed to do the job and works really well so whatever is easiest or most accessible for you mm -hmm. is what I recommend and I don't think you can go wrong either way. Yeah. But Landscape. it makes a huge difference between the beds and stuff. Or it does. Under the beds, especially around the edges, is usually where you see a lot of 
Like yeah. in Arizona, we get like Bermuda grass that grows along the edge of the bed mm -hmm. or just a, a great place for yeah. weeds yeah. to pop up. I don't know. It sucks because weed barrier is not, it's like a plasticky type of thing. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do it, I didn't buy super high quality stuff. So it kind of shredded in certain places. And mm -hmm. now there's like, I can see like last summer I could see there was like pieces of it like floating around my yard mm -hmm. and I just didn't like that because I'm like creating trash on my own property yeah. so right I, yeah. yeah I'd say if you do it get a high quality one that isn't going to shred in one season yeah just do the additional cost if you're going to do it because I didn't want to pay that much mm -hmm. for it um because I was like I'm just gonna put rocks over it but you know it does get wear and tear so get a high quality one if you're gonna do that so that it doesn't rip up yeah and end up as microplastics in your yard. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, cardboard's a great thing to have, and it, yeah. it's natural, and but it's not gonna be a weed barrier forever. No, it's not. So there's that too. Yeah, that's kind of the other side of it is it's not forever, but in theory, like if you did it around your raised bed gardens, mm -hmm. and it keeps the weeds coming up for two seasons or three seasons even, and then you have a, a mulch or rocks on top of it, and then you're continuously traversing and compacting that area, then you'll keep the weeds down mm -hmm. naturally. Yeah. What the heck yeah. is biochar? And is it beneficial, unnecessary? Like, when can you buy it and then add it into commercial mixes? Like, just somebody asked biochar. Biochar? Okay. Yeah, like what? You're almost asking the right person. Like, my partner yeah. just finished her PhD and she studies. <laughs> biochar and arid agriculture yeah so i know a little bit about that okay biochar biochar is basically the process of taking carbon material so glad i paid attention in a dissertation <laughs> <laughs> anyways biochar is the process in which you take uh carbon rich material like wood waste and you heat it up in a high temperature kind of like in a kiln but without mm -hmm. oxygen and so you heat it up to very, very high temperature and basically carbonize, you know, you turn wood into charcoal without oxygen mm. and it becomes a solid form of carbon. And it looks kind of like charcoal, but this gives the material uh, porosity and increased water holding capacity, mm -hmm. as well as the ability to hold on to nutrients and to keep nutrients in the soil okay and so a lot of the research that's being done on it now is still out there as to how much of an effect it has and how much of an increased water holding capacity and how much nutrients it absorbs and releases to the plants all those specifics are still in the research phase mm -hmm. but overall i can say that biochar is beneficial and can provide long-term soil health as well as a form of carbon sequestration where you're putting carbon in the soil in a solid form where it will stay for hundreds of years or at least tens of years if not hundreds of years wow and so biochar is very cool we're working on co-composting biochar um, we did that for the experiment for the university of arizona we've also started doing it for vineyards and we are currently developing a biochar co-composted biochar product Ooh. and it has a lot of other promising traits that have yet to be studied and I really like biochar and I think it's a fantastic way to use organic material and mm -hmm. if you can get your hands on biochar, you know, it's a good material to mix in with your soil for increased water holding capacity, increased nutrient mm -hmm. holding as well as um, some other things that are still being researched. Yeah, so, that's awesome. Yeah, so it's, it's very just cool. like a bagged product or you could just like buy a bag so of it? at the moment you can't really buy bags of it i don't okay. think anybody really sells it that i know of um but i think it's going to be a very popular product it's kind mm -hmm. of an up and coming mm -hmm. material that you'll probably see more and more of and hear about more mm -hmm. and more and we actually use biochar in the supermix organic fertilizer yeah i was gonna say mm -hmm. i think it's in one of your products yeah, yeah. okay well, that's cool. So if you want to see biochar in action, you can check out the fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it works. The fertilizer works really great. I mean, you guys have seen the results from yeah. my plants specifically. Is that anywhere related to activated charcoal? Similar. Um, 
but basically the process of making it is different mm -hmm. and how it reacts is different yeah i yeah people use activated charcoal in like terrarium settings mm -hmm. like to keep it pure like to purify the soil mm -hmm. or something like that i just heard it was like a soil purifier yeah so biochar and charcoal and then more specifically biochar can absorb heavy metals and mm -hmm. nutrients and purify the soil or help to keep those out of the the roots or out of the plants okay and so that might be why people recommend using it because it can bind those harmful mm -hmm. materials or elements in the soil hmm. but again that's one of those things that's very cool but the research on how much to use and how effective it is and what you can expect from it is still being done right mm. now okay yeah or it's, it's an early product. We're not. Yeah. We're still researching. Not well. Not me, as in we, but. But the people are. The, the royal we. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Humanity. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming yeah. on. This was great. Just of to course. do a little general Q and A. Yeah. Um, if you guys have any more questions or you would like to hear more about anything specifically that we talked about, you can leave a comment down below, and I'm sure Shota will be. Mm -hmm browsing the comments yeah, here and there, um, at least within the first day of posting. So if you catch it early, um, you'll probably hear from Shota. Yeah. I just put you on the spot. I don't know if you No, know I do. I normally, whenever we do a video <laughs> together, I go on like for the first two weeks and I like, browse the comments Cool. every couple of days for the first couple of weeks to answer any questions. Cool. Well, yeah. Well, there's... Now you know. He'll yeah. be here. <laughs> Alright, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Again, I'll have the playlist of all of our videos together linked down below so that we mm -hmm. can learn all the things that there are to learn. If anything in here sounded interesting to you, we did discuss a lot of this on a deeper level in other videos. So definitely listen to it like a podcast. Just go about your day and absorb mm -hmm. the knowledge that Shota has all up in his his head. I was going to say his hairy head. <laughs> yeah, it is hairy. <laughs> and today I have it down. So you can see I know. It. I've never seen it down before. No. No. <laughs> no. I washed it this morning, so I'm wearing it down, letting it Yeah. Hang. Yeah. Just letting it air out. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right. Well, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Well, I think Cooper is going to interview you. <laughs> well, Cooper, thank you for having me. It's just a real pleasure being here. <laughs> Whenever you're ready to start, bud. I got answers for your questions. <laughs> <laughs> He's just staring at you. Who is this?